Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing well. I'd like to talk with you today about value capture. I'm going to name some of the largest internet companies in the world. You have almost certainly heard of them. Amazon, Google, Facebook, PayPal, Uber, Airbnb, Netflix. Each of these large internet companies captured a great deal of value with their revenues in the billions of dollars. All of these companies got their start because of the invention of the World Wide Web. The web was invented in the late 80s by the computer scientist Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who was working at CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research. He saw an opportunity to join hypertext, which was an existing technology, with the internet, which also existed. What he did is he took hypertext and he connected it to the TCP IP and domain name systems, and the result was the World Wide Web we all know and love which has had a profound impact on humanity the world over. During the 90s, the internet exploded in usage as commercial organizations built the first commercial websites. All of us who are over the age of 40 are aware that there was a massive internet boom from 1995 and then a huge crash as the dot-com bubble burst in 2001. Many internet companies were started during the boom and many of these internet companies crashed and burned, never to be heard of again. It's been 25 years now since the start of the commercial web and the household internet company names that I mentioned earlier, as I said, have captured a great deal of value. That value has been captured by the shareholders of these companies. By owning these companies, individual investors have made a lot of money. Of course, investors also lost a lot of money if they invested in the wrong internet companies over that time period. And it was hard to know which companies to invest in that would survive. Although there were clues along the way which investors could spot when they were deciding which of the internet companies to invest in. Amazon, Google, Facebook and PayPal, it was obvious that they would succeed. Google was obvious to me in the late 90s, Amazon in the early 2000s, Facebook by 2005 and PayPal by 2002. Success leaves signs and investors know where to look and what to look for. Rising earnings, strong management teams, a large month-on-month -month increase in users and various other metrics. So with the Internet of Information, the value has been captured by the shareholders of the big online web platforms. The Internet of Information we're all aware of. It's obvious to all of us now how much the World Wide Web has revolutionised all of our lives. We're 25 years in with the Internet of Information. The Internet of Information disrupted all the traditional publishing houses as it gave everybody the ability to publish. It gave everyone a voice, and that scared a lot of powerful people. Before the World Wide Web, only publishers and large media corporations had the ability to publish or broadcast to a wide audience. Now look, here I am on camera talking with you today with great lighting, a nice backdrop and perfect sound, leveraging Facebook, which has connected all of us together in ways that would have been unimaginable to our ancestors. We only very recently, however, entered the era of the internet of money. You've all heard of Bitcoin. Most of you don't understand it, and that's okay as we're still so very early. Most of you don't understand how email works either, but you know enough to send an email. It's become very simple and easy to send an email. It used to be difficult 25 years ago. Bitcoin is difficult today. Bitcoin is the internet of money. It's money over IP, or in simpler terms, it's money over the internet. The internet of money will be as disruptive to the big financial companies as the internet of information was to the big publishing companies. And we've only really just gotten started with all of this. Behind the scenes, an army of nerds, that's people like me, are working around the clock to make sure that the big financial companies are disrupted and the power of money, the power of banking, is given to the people. The nerds are working hard because they understand that giving the power of a Swiss bank to everyone on the planet is an extremely powerful idea whose time has come. And note, I said Swiss bank, not bank account. The reason the big financial companies exist, the ultimate bottom line, is because computer scientists, that's people like me, had not yet solved the Byzantine generals problem. 
This meant that there was no way to keep track of a distributed ledger of money, which is why banks exist. There needed to be a centralized authority to keep track of all the transactions that occurred between people. And this is important due to what's known as the double spend problem. The double spend problem refers to if I have $50 and I spend it buying a product or service from you, we have to be absolutely sure that I spent the money, that you received the money, and there was no way that I could spend the money twice or double spend it. Banks keep a centralized ledger of transactions. Centralization means everything we see today when we look around and see large financial companies and big banks, which dominate all of our lives. Things are going to look very different in the years to come. And with the development of Bitcoin, we now have a way to keep a distributed or decentralized ledger of transactions. This is what's known as the blockchain, which is all the transactions that have occurred in Bitcoin going back in time to the very first transaction. In simple terms, what we're looking at with cryptocurrencies is the dawn of the era of digital scarcity. It was previously thought that digital scarcity was impossible. For instance, when you use your computer, it's trivially easy for you to create copies of all your files in as large a quantity as you like and at no cost. But to have a digital item that is scarce means we can attach value to that scarce item in the same way we do to assets in the physical world, like property. Property has value because it sits on land that has value. The land is scarce, and as the saying goes, they're not making any more land. Of course, they are making plenty more apartments on that land, but I won't go there in this video. With Bitcoin, we have a scarce, fixed supply digital asset. Remember that Bitcoin is money over the internet. We've entered the era of the internet of money, where money is being disrupted in the same way publishing was with information. With the internet of money, though, the bulk of the value is not being captured by the big internet platforms like Facebook, Google, Amazon, and the like. And it is not being captured by startups in the cryptocurrency space either. In the internet of money, the value is being captured in the digital assets themselves. This is why you've seen Bitcoin boom in value over the past 10 years and it will continue to boom in value over the next 10 years as well. In the internet of money, the value is captured in the protocol layer, which is Bitcoin. In the internet of information, or the current World Wide Web, as we all know and love, the value was all captured in the application layer, or by the online platforms, and by the shareholders of those online platforms. So what does this mean for us as investors? Well, it means if you want to make a large amount of money, from the emerging internet of money, the way to do it is by buying and holding the cryptocurrencies themselves, because the vast bulk of the value that is created will accrue in the cryptocurrencies in terms of their market value and prices. Most of the cryptocurrencies, however, will fail. Bitcoin, I believe, will succeed. Bitcoin will capture the vast bulk of the value, and that will be seen as in its high and ever-growing market price. The market is sending a very strong message, and that message is Bitcoin is the winner. Bitcoin is the winner of store of value. Bitcoin is money over the internet. Bitcoin is the category killer. Cross-border money movements, secure online transactions, financial settlements, wealth storage, and use cases we can't even think of at the moment will use Bitcoin as a foundation. Now, people say Bitcoin is too volatile to use as a currency, and at the moment, they're right. What we're witnessing is Bitcoin as an emerging, emerging store of value. We, you, me, all of us alive right now, in real time, we're all witnessing an emergency, emerging store of value. And that's an incredible thing to see and witness. Gold during its early days was highly volatile. But the lesson from history is that the people, the societies, the groups of people that picked and used the hardest money, the scarcest money, or the best store of value, won over time. These people had an incredible advantage because the money they picked was harder than the money the other groups and people picked. Beads, seashells, cattle, these were all used as money in the past, but all are bad stores of value. The group that picked and used gold as a store of value won over time. Gold has been used as a store of value for thousands of years, 
What we're seeing with Bitcoin is it is displacing gold as the ultimate store of value. It will displace and disrupt, disrupt property and other assets as well that are being used by people as a store of value. What we're witnessing is a dematerialization of gold in the same way we witnessed it with so many other analog items which became digital as computers took off and reshaped society. My message to you is this, buy Bitcoin, own Bitcoin, hold on to Bitcoin as a store of value, make it your reserve asset in the same way that Michael Saylor, the CEO of MicroStrategy did. Bitcoin is fixed in supply, it's incredibly scarce, and over time, because you own Bitcoin, you will have a great advantage over other people or groups because you have chosen the money that is hardest and scarcest in comparison to other people. It will mean that your assets will increase in value faster than other people, as Bitcoin is the scarcest asset out there and is appreciating the fastest. I hope you enjoyed this presentation today. All the best, everyone. I'm Clark Towson.